Chesed Veshalom, my friends. Ron Smith here with uh, readings through the Torah. And this week we have that double portion, you know, Akhre Mod and Kiroshim. And uh, that being, of course, Leviticus, I said, of course, <laughs> Leviticus chapter 16. And going to take in Kiroshim, which goes all the way through chapter 22. Well, I'm sorry, chapter 20. Uh, I was giving you three portions ahead there in my head. So. Anyway, really a couple of fairly short portions, and so we combine them in this uh, in this particular year of reading. And before we get into the second part, I'm, I'm putting this in about uh, three, maybe four settings. And already covered chapter 16 yesterday. I say covered. It didn't really even go into the Sudur at all. But today I want to cover, take a look at Leviticus 17 and 18. And as we do, let's pray. Avinu, our Father, we thank you for this opportunity today to uh, to look into your holy, eternal word. We thank you that you have you have set new grooves in our brain so that the delusion doesn't this doesn't hold any attraction to us. It, it's dead to us. And you have set that new groove in our brains so that we may have life in you and in your ways. We appreciate that. We love you and, and thank you so much for what you have done. Uh, all centered around that marvelous event in AD 31. Today as we look into your eternal word, we ask that you would anoint this time and speak to each person where they are by your spirit as your servant mumbles into this microphone that your spirit would speak to each person right where they are and we thank you again for that Beshem Yeshua in Jesus name Amen well again we are going to read Leviticus chapter 17 and 18 let me begin here with chapter 17 verse 1 through 7 of Leviticus it says Adonai said to Moshe Speak to Aaron and sons and to all the people of Israel. Tell them that this is what Adonai has heard. When someone from the community of Israel slaughters an ox, a lamb, or a goat inside or outside the camp without bringing it to the entrance of the tent of meeting to present it as an offering to Adonai before the tabernacle of Adonai, he is to be charged with blood. He has shed blood, and that person is to be cut off from his people. The reason for this is that the people of Israel will bring their sacrifices that they sacrifice out in the field so that they will bring them to Adonai, to the entrance to the tent of meeting, to the Kohen, to the priest, and sacrifice them as peace offerings to Adonai. The Kohen will splash the blood against the altar of Adonai, the entrance to the tent of meeting, and make the fat go up and smoke as a pleasing aroma for Adonai. And no longer will they, the Canaanites, no longer will they offer the sacrifices to the goat demons before whom they prostitute themselves. This is a permanent regulation for them throughout all of their generations. Okay. A little bit of comment here. Due to varying sensitivities, I will not go into the ways and means of the various peoples of Canaan before Israel came into said land. I will only say this, a prohibition is here established to curtail offering quote-unquote sacrifices to goat demons. One example, kind of a modern re, uh, residual reappearing of goat demons is in the, uh, in, there's these parades going on nowadays, Krampus parades. Now, I'm not saying Krampus and that whole tradition of Nicholas and, Tr and Krampus are exactly the same as the goat demons of Canaan. However, you know, just take a look at a Krampus crusade or uh, a parade by me and you'll see that uh, those dressed up as Krampus are portraying goat demons. But nonetheless, I know there will be arguments there. But we, we are seeing a, a try at a resurgence from time to time it seems to be about every seven years that these resurging uh, residual spirits even you know 
fairly recently, you know, in the in a little bit of news floating around of spirit cooking. All these weird things going on is a resurgence of what the Bible would call goat demons. It's just simply demonic spirits. And the Canaanites did some really awful things. Uh, I'm not going to, well, I probably will go into it further in the notes, but uh, e Egypt enslaved people. The Assyrians from, from Damascus to Babylon had a particular way about them that influenced the Canaanites. And the Canaanites uh, took in many of those traditions into themselves. Uh, a lot of people came in to Canaan from Assyria, from the Assyrian Empire of the time, and carried with them some horrible practices. And the Lord is just simply saying, hey, you know, uh, bring any of your offerings, bring your peace offerings, peace offerings meaning, you know, because we have peace. They may not, but we have peace. Bring those peace offerings into the tabernacle. I don't want you to be influenced by the world you're going to be in. I want you to influence them. Okay? In the same manner that Israel surrounded Mount Sinai, so also Israel is to have her or our focus all around our God, even when away from Mount Sinai. When offerings of Akim, when offering uh, sacrifices, be they oxen, sheep, or goats, you know, and Zivakim is something that you eat, okay? You, in other words, this is, this is very much similar to going to a restaurant, only the Lord at that time was saying, don't go to those restaurants. You know, bring them to our house. So it says that the blood is to be splashed upon the copper altar. The copper altar was within the tabernacle. And basically his whole gist, the Lord's whole gist in this particular scene is demonism is a no-no forever. Okay, so he doesn't want, he wants us to influence the world rather than the world influence us. Let's look at Leviticus 17, verse 8 through 16. And uh, actually we'll make... Uh, make that a, an end of chapter 17 it's really rather simple but let's read it here also tell them when someone from the community of Israel or or one of the foreigners the Gerim one of the uh, converts living with you offers a burnt offering or sacrifice without bringing it to the entrance to the tent of meeting to sacrifice to Adonai that person will be cut off from his people when someone from the community of Israel or one of the foreigners, one of the Gerim, li well, actually, I think there's two different words here, living with, with you eats any kind of blood, I will set myself against that person who eats blood and cut him off from his people. From the life, for the life of the creature is in the blood. Now, I'm going to translate this here, but I'm just going to read it now in the, uh, in the English. For the life of the creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for yourselves. For it is the blood that makes atonement because of the life. This is why I told the people of Israel, none of you is to eat blood, nor any foreigner living with you to eat blood. When someone from the community of Israel or one of the foreigners living with you hunts and catches game, whether animal or bird, that may be eaten, he is to pour out its blood and cover it with earth. For the life of every creature, its blood is its life. Therefore I said to the people of Israel, you are not to eat the blood of any creature, because the life of every creature is in its blood. Whoever eats it will be cut off. Uh, anyone eating an animal that dies naturally or torn to death by wild animals, uh, whether he is a citizen or a foreigner, is to wash his clothes and bathe himself in water, and he will be unclean till evening, then he will be clean. But if he doesn't wash them or bathe his body, he will bear the consequences of his wrongdoing. Okay, so, six times Torah prohibits the eating of blood. Okay, and you just read uh, <laughs> most of the times right here. Kind of repeated. The prohibition extends into the, renew co the renewed covenant, the what we call the New Testament, recorded there in Acts chapter 15, verse 29. The, the prohibition is issued to both the Beit Israel, the house of Israel, and the Ger, the convert. A central line within the whole of redemptive history is this line. Ki nefesh habashar hadam hiv ve'ani natal... Pardon me. <laughs> 
ואני נת... נתתיו לקיים על המזבח לכפר על נפשתוקים כי הדם הוא הנפש מכפר. Here's the English, because the soul, the life of the flesh, is in its blood. And I have given him a nativ. I have given him to you upon the altar to recover and to atone for your souls. For it is the blood in the soul that will atone. Unquote. For this reason we do not... For this reason, we do what we need to stay away from consuming blood. We, we approach that with respect, because there is a prophecy here. I give, or literally, I will give him on the altar to make atonement for so, the And I want to, I want to point out here because it was asked when I presented this before, uh, because of issues going on nowadays with, uh, you know, with with folks. Co- Folks coming into the borders of Western lands, well, we may not even know their names. They're not vetted, and so uh, you know this particular passage that I have just read and passages like it are cited among folks saying the foreigner using the word foreigner. There are four different Hebrew words translated as foreigner or stranger in King James, and those four different words are all very different things. They're rendered with one word, and I think that throws a bit of confusion on it. And the Bible here talks about this, that this thing of not eating blood and so forth applies both to the citizen and the foreigner. The word there is gear, but when it says in our text, we see uh, chapter 17, verse 10, when someone from the community of Israel or any of the foreigners living with you eats any blood, I will set myself against that person. Now the word... Uh, I don't have my Hebrew text out with me right now turn to this part, but I'm pretty sure the word foreigner here is zer. Zer is uh, not a nice word. And there are many times when the word zer will appear, and you can even tell from the context that zer is actually out to do you harm. Zer is uh, a little bit more than not trust. And not care is one who's, who's questioned and, and not necessarily trusted though he may be with you. Zer is not with you. The Gair, G-E-R, the Gair, is a convert. He is actually on your side and with your people. The Zer is not. Now that is, we have to understand, America, that not every foreigner is with you. Not every, not, <laughs> there are four different Hebrew words for this. We need to translate them. We need to, to know what they say, what they are. Okay, so... The Zer is the one that the Lord will set himself against. Okay, carrying on. In the granted situation of catching game within a hunt, uh, you know, eat and be happy, says our text, but give the life, the blood, a proper burial. If you eat an animal that has been torn, uh, killed by other predators aside from yourself, or if the animal has died naturally, clean up or suffer the consequences you know you, you don't know how long that dead animal's been laying there right and i i appreciate um conservationist conservationalist you know pr- people tons of people in america who are conservation uh <laughs> i lost my train of thought or not my train of thought but how to say this um Ted Nugent in the last, Mr. Ted Nugent in the last couple of decades has, because of his popularity as a musician, has brought this uh, to uh, to a lot of people's attention. Conservationists protect the animals when they go out hunting. They have a mind to to hunt with respect toward you know toward the game. Uh, Ted Nugent and a lot of people like him will actually pray over that animal once he has shot him Uh, you know folks will think well that's a little odd well odd maybe because not everybody's a conservationist but nonetheless that's that's in other words a a matter of yes you hunt but you actually respect that which you hunt because that's what's being talked about here Yes, we'll go into Leviticus 18. We'll take this in Leviticus 18, verses 1 through 5. 
See how much time I've been, oh, I've been talking for nearly 15 minutes. Chapter 18, 1 through 5 says, Adonai said to Moshe, Speak to the people of Israel, tell them, I am Adonai your God. I am your God, not, not these other myriad of gods. I am Adonai your God. You are not to engage in the activities of the activities found in the land of Egypt where you used to live, and you're not to engage in the activities found in the land of Canaan where I am going to bring you, nor are you to live by their laws. You are to obey my rulings and laws and live accordingly. I am Adonai your God. You are to observe my laws and rulings. If a person does them, he will have life through them. I am Adonai. And a simple comment. While the Egyptians were enslaving, I said this a little bit ago, while the Egyptians were enslaving, the folks of Canaan could be quite ruthless and disgusting. We are not to be seduced to go along with the weirdness around us. It takes faith in our God to follow his ways rather than those of the Goyim. And the word Goyim throughout the Bible, it's translated in these three ways, nations, heathen, and Gentiles, and it almost always has to do and Paul kind of changed it up a little bit but it almost always has to do aside from Paul with people who are not part of God's people they are they are pagans as we show our trust in our God by following his ways instead we find life via that trust our trust is in him his ways are part and parcel of who he is and so his ways transform us and we find life there let's look at Leviticus 18 verses 6 through 21 none of you is to approach anyone who is a close relative in order to have sexual relations I am Adonai you are not to have sexual relations with your father you are not to have sexual relations with your mother she's your mother do not have sexual relations with her. You're not to have sexual relations with your father's wife. That's your father's prerogative. You're not to have sexual relations with your sister, the daughter of your father, or the daughter of your mother, whether born at home or else, elsewhere. Do not have sexual relations with them. You're not to have sexual relations with your son's daughter or with your daughter's daughter. Do not have sexual relations with them because their sexual disgrace will be your own. You are not to have sexual relations with your father's wife's daughter. Born to your father because she is your sister. Do not have sexual relations with her. You are not to have sexual relations with your father's sister because she is your father's close relative. You are not to have sexual relations with your mother's sister because she is your mother's close relative. You are not to have sex. You're not to disgrace your father's brother by having sexual relations with his wife because she's your aunt. You're not to have sexual relations with your daughter-in-law because she's your son's wife. Do not have sexual relations with her. You are not to have sexual relations with your brother's wife because that is your brother's prerogative. You are not to have sexual relations with, uh, with both a woman and her daughter nor are you to have sexual relations with her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter. They are close relatives of hers, and it would be shameful. You're not to take a woman to be a rival with her sister and have sexual relations with her while her sister is still alive. You're not to approach a woman in order to have sexual relations with her when she is, is unclean from her time of nida. You are not to go to bed with your neighbor's wife and thus become unclean with, with her. And finally, uh, verse 21, you are not to let any of your children be sacrificed to Molech, thereby profaning the name of your God. I am Adonai. Uh, this is pretty straightforward. Al Sha'arim, flesh relations, are off limits for sexual relations immediate family as well as in-laws the only individual the only individual one should have sexual relationships with is your spouse okay that's I would like to think that's pretty clear in this context also forbidden is sexual relations uh, with mom or dad just in case you missed that forbidden uh, for such 
is also a woman as well as her sister. You know, we just read that her sexual relations within Nida, which is a woman's period, is a no-no as well as with uh, the next door neighbor's wife. And please do not sacrifice, quote unquote sacrifice, your children into the ovens of Molech. The inhabitants of Canaan, again, were, their morals were a little bit more than loose. Uh, and I, I said I'd probably explain this, because it, it gets asked. Uh, Baal means lured, and the, it was a smaller statue into which you would throw smaller individuals to burn. Molech was a larger oven. Molech means king, and it was a larger oven. Now, we we really have a hard time thinking about the, the Holocaust, obviously, and we you know, can justify, can we not? Justify going to war in order to end the craziness, the, the horror of the Holocaust. Understand, the was doing the same thing. If you have, if you believe that war should have been done against the Nazis, as well as well as Japan, because of these matters, then you maybe can understand why the Lord sent Israel in. Israel didn't want to have war. Israel were slaves. But sent Israel in in order to, you know, conquer this land, conquer these, these people because, because they were offering their children in the ovens of Molech. Okay, so I just wanted to explain some things. You know, when we study the Bible, there's three... Uh, important rules to study and three important things we must take into account. Those things are context, context, and context. Leviticus chapter 18 verses 22 through verse 36. You are not to go to bed with a man as with a woman. It is an abomination. You are not to have sexual relations with any kind of animal and thus become unclean with it. Nor is any woman to present herself to an animal to have sexual relations with it. It's a perversion. Do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things, because all these nations which I am expelling ahead of you are defiled with them. The land has become unclean, and this is why I am punishing it. The land itself will vomit out its inhabitants. But you are to keep my laws and rulings and not engage in any of these disgusting practices. Neither the citizen nor the uh, foreigners living with you, the gear living with you. For the, the people of the land have committed all these abominations, and the land is, is now defiled. It's now corrupt. It's now decayed. If you make the land unclean, it will vomit you out as well. Just as it is vomiting out the, the nation that was there before you. For those who engage in any of these disgusting practices, whoever they may be, will be cut off from their people. So keep my charge not to follow any of these abominable customs that others before you have followed and thus defile yourselves by doing it. I am Adonai your God. Okay, well, very simply, sexual relations outside husband and wife, which is forbidden, also includes homosexuality and bestiality. These prohibitions are binding on the citizen of Israel as well as the gear, the convert. It may be of interest that Leviticus 18 verse 23a addresses men in the second person, while Leviticus 18.23b addresses women in the third person. That is, in the passage that I just read, God speaks to men a little bit more directly than he does to the ladies. In our current text, even the land itself is personified as a life force. That is to say, it vomits out what it cannot stomach. But this is not merely a matter of a tiny piece of real estate bordering the Mediterranean Sea. It applies to all, any and all lands. And it, the, the people themselves become defiled and God therefore allows the land to vomit them out from their people. Okay. We begin this discussion. We began this, dis this, this discussion back in Leviticus chapter 11, wherein we are told to guard against, quote-unquote, prostituting ourselves. We, the discussion really throughout 
uh, the midsection of Leviticus is about holiness, and holiness is defined by being able to distinguish between holy and common, between clean and unclean, between what is an abomination and what is life, between decay and corruption and that which is living. We, we say distinguishing in the, uh, in the Hebrew text, in the New Testament, we call it discerning. It's the same thing. Okay, those are just simply two English words that uh, really are synonymous. So really we're talking about being able to discern, to distinguish. And within all of that, there's a lot of context about our sexuality and as well as uh, what gods we chase. What, you know, there's only one God, the rest are demons. This does not speak merely of sexual exploitations, but of a turning away in general. The word zoning for prostitutes, when it, says, when it talks about prostituting ourselves, that word is zoning. And it's used for general acts of apostasy. General acts of, of apostasy. The Greek version of that word, okay, the Hebrew is zonim. The Greek version of it is zozanion. Zozanion is rendered as tares in Matthew 13. A tear is a is a piece of of a plant a grass that looks just like wheat, but you know the difference really when those two pieces become mature. So really, there's there's a look like that a look alike there. A tear is not a plant in itself; as it is actually a degenerate form of wheat. It's the bearded so I will here turn my attention briefly to what we might call modern apostasy. And by the way, it has been a while, I say this to folks listening to me, uh, our little group studied the revelation of Yeshua the Messiah, the revelation of Jesus the Christ, but it was therein that I reminded folks that in Revelation chapter 22 verse 15, where it says, outside the city, outside of heaven, are the dogs. I reminded folks that the word dogs there is understood as the sexually perverse in general or homosexual specifically when viewing that idiom it's an idiom through its beginning in Deuteronomy chapter 23 verse 18 and 19 that is where the idiom of dogs begins and is talking about people who are sexually perverse or are homosexuals okay so here's the little presentation of a mental going astray I want to focus in on the Greek word paralogizimai. It's a, it's a, I'm, not, I'm not a Greek speaker, but it's the best I can do. Uh, it means a mental strain. I've often thought of Leviticus 11 as a presentation of that which might make a person physically ill or physically sick. I've also thought of Leviticus 18, what we've just read, as a presentation of such that speaks of a mental illness, a mental going astray, that is and there are varying degrees in that and also that in turn makes the land sick the land wants to vomit you up second thessalonians chapter 2 verse 11 appears within a last days scenario it speaks of god quote causing them to go astray so that they believe the lie god causing them to go astray so that they believe the lie them in this case are those who refuse to love the truth and if you look through the Bible, truth, the word truth is used as a synonym for the eternal word of God, the eternal Torah of God. And the word that's rendered as delusion, it says he will send a strong delusion in the last days. The word delusion there is the Greek word paralogosome, paralogosomai, I should say. And that word means a mental going astray, a mental that's in your head. Again, this happens in this last days scenario because the delusion comes to those who refuse to obey the truth. Let me give you another text. In Isaiah, Yeshayahu chapter 66, it says that those who do not tremble at Adonai's word, who forsake a contrite and humble spirit, will receive from the Lord a choice of delusions, a choice of tricks. In this last day scenario in Isaiah, the Lord sends a test, something that, that
that proves and tests us and even tricks us so that the very things we fear come upon us. Let me let me go ahead and turn there. I I want to go ahead and read it because uh, you know context. I <laughs> I just got through saying that the three rules of studying the Bible are context, context, and context. So Isaiah 66 1 says, "Heaven is my throne," says Adonai, "and earth is my footstool." What kind of house could you possibly build for me? What sort of place could you devise for my rest? Didn't I myself make all these things? This is how they. All came to be, says Adonai. And then he says this, The kind of person on whom I look with favor is the one with a humble and a, a poor and humble spirit who trembles at my word. Those, those others might as well kill a person as an ox, as well as break a dog's neck or, as to sacrifice a lamb. As well offer pig's blood as offering a, a grain offering. As well bless an idol as burn incense. Just as these have chosen their ways and enjoy their disgusting practices, so I will enjoy making fools of them. I will enjoy sending them the delusions and bring on them the very things they fear. For when I called them, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not hear. Instead, they did what was evil in my sight and chose what I did not hear. have said, they have said, let Adonai be glorified so that we can see your joy, but they will be put to shame. They, that uproar in the city, that sound from the temple in the sound of, is the sound of Adonai repaying his foe what they deserve. Before going into labor, she gave birth. Before her pains came, she delivered a male, a male child. Who ever heard of such a thing? Who has ever seen such things? Is a country born in one day? Turn the page. It is a nation brought forth all at once? For as soon as Tion went into labor, she brought forth her children. Who would I let the baby break through and not be born? Asked God and I. Would I, who's, who causes the birth, shut the womb? Ask your God. And he goes on to say, Rejoice. And it really brings in a, very much a last day's scenario. In fact, chapter 60, 64 through 66 of Isaiah is that last day scenario. So, in the text, I, I, I just read uh, Dr. David Stern's translation. In the text, it says, I will choose a delusion for them who do not tremble after my word. We read before in Second Thessalonians that he chooses a delusion for those who do not have a love for the truth. It's the same thing. But speaking of trembling at God's word, we here go finally to James chapter 1, verse 22 through 25, remembering that the deception that God chooses for us is that which we either curiously or lustfully looked upon in the first place. James chapter 1 again, quote, Don't deceive, don't delude, paralogosamai, don't deceive or delude yourselves, by only hearing what the word says, but do it. For whoever hears the word but doesn't do what it says is like someone who looks at his at the face of his birth in a mirror. Face of his birth, birth there is Genesis. It's not usually translated, but I'm translating it for you. One who hears the word but doesn't do what it says is like someone who looks at the face of his birth in a mirror, who looks at himself, goes away, and immediately neglects what he looked like. Boy. But if a person looks closely, stoops down into the perfect Torah, which gives freedom and continues, becoming not a neglecting, quote-unquote, hearer, but a doer of the work it requires, then he will be blessed in what he does. My good and sensible friends, we, we might have cause to be confused about a few things, seemingly tricked, as it were. But as followers of Messiah Yeshua, followers of Christ Jesus, we have a face to view, and that face is our own face, that face of our new birth, as found in the pages of the Bible, as found in the pages of the Torah itself, even renewed in the pages of the New Testament. This is who we are. If we peek into the Holy Bible without continuing to, you know, la soc de vere, 
Torah, to engross ourselves in the words of the book, this one is the one who neglects who he is. We are neglecting ourselves. Within the, the three examples of delusions that I gave, I trust that you, the listener, see how the Lord chooses for us what we have already chosen within our hearts. Do not delude yourselves, my friends. That's the way James ends that particular passage. Do not delude or deceive yourselves, my friends. Well, a little bit more of that passage that I read in Isaiah. Not all of Israel have been Zionism, have been for Zionism. But to those who tremble at his word, the Lord opens a forward look into the birth of the third commonwealth of Israel in a single day. I'm speaking this a couple of days after uh, Israel's 69th Independence Day celebration. But we, I, have to keep thanking God for you always, brothers, whom the Lord loves, because God chose you as first fruits for deliverance, first fruits for salvation, by giving you the holiness that has its origin in the Spirit and the faithfulness that has its origin in the truth. Okay, let me read that again. He has given us the holiness that has its origin in the Spirit. We have been reading in the middle part of Leviticus about holiness. That comes from the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God inspired the writing of the Bible. Even the part that I have been reading in Leviticus and that has its origin in the Spirit, and the faithfulness that we have within us has its origin in the truth. <clears throat> truth, there is a broader spectrum of the whole of the Bible. He called you to this through our good news. When you heard the, the gospel preached and you came to Jesus, to Yeshua, for salvation, then he also led you into into discipleship, into training in the word of truth so that you could have the glory of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. Therefore, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions you were taught by us. When Paul says hold to the traditions that were taught by us, he's saying in a Hebraic way, Bishomre Mesoret, whether we spoke them or wrote them in a letter, these traditions. And may our Lord Yeshua the Messiah himself and the God of our Father who has loved us and by his grace has given us eternal comfort and good hope comfort your hearts and strengthen you in every good word and deed. When, when Paul writes that, uh, you know, hold to, to the traditions whether we spoke them or wrote them, that, that's two different uh, handing down of the traditions. Traditions are given orally, the uh, Torah al the uh, the Torah by the mouth, you know, interpretations of the Word of God by the mouth. We spoke them, or we may have written them down. When Paul here is talking about traditions, he's talking about halakha. He's talking about uh, the way... The wise men of of uh, the wise men, the Hazal, the wise men of blessed memory, all the way back to Moses, all the way to the seventy spoken of in Exodus chapter eighteen, all the way to Paul's time. They they gave Torah to the people in terms of making decisions for them, and you know actually into Nehemiah. There's a teaching there of how to give to the people a the ability to make these decisions themselves through their own reading of the Torah. So Paul here is, is actually advocating those things. Be Shomrei Mesoret. Mesoret is actually, uh, we call the Maseratis, those who uh, in the 8th century to the 10th century put the vowel points within the Hebrew text because, uh, you know, Hebrew speakers after Hebrew had been outlawed, um, you know, couldn't remember how to say the words. And so they put vowel points in them. Those were rabbis who did that. Shomrei Misret means those who keep the tradition. So 
Paul here is not merely saying, hey, yes, keep the Torah, but also even the, the traditions. This is being orthodox, okay? So when I have been reading about holiness, here I'm reading about Paul saying, hey, let's be orthodox. He's saying this to Thessalonians, not to Jews. He's saying this to Gentiles. My friends, we're not called to merely be saved from sin, but to also enter into holiness. And I want to encourage you in that. I want to poke some courage into you. I, that, I'm not saying I want to compliment you. I want to poke some courage into you. It may feel good. It may not. But I want to encourage you to live out the truth. Rak hazat ve'ematz. Only be strong and be bold, my friends. Well, with that, I will conclude uh, the first of these two portions. Again, we have a double portion this week. We will look next into the portion called Kedoshim, meaning holy ones. Shalom, my friends.